Hey guys, this is Andrew with High Level Reviews, and today I'd like to take a look at Star Ocean, the second story. The game was developed by Trice and published by Sony, in North America that is, it was published by Enix in Japan. It was released in America in 1999 for the PlayStation and eventually saw an enhanced remaster come to the PSP called Star Ocean Second Evolution in 2009. As usual, I'll be focusing on the original. Trice is known for infusing action-heavy combat with multi-layered skill systems into their games. The founders originally worked for Japan's Wolf Team and created Tales of Fantasia while they were there, which is the predecessor to the Star Ocean games in several very important ways, that being that the player controls one character while the AI controls the others, and it shares a system that allows the player to assign skills for use in combat. The foundation of Star Ocean 2 is a remarkably stable one, from a deep crafting system that encourages experimentation and a chaotic but fluid action-based fighting system, Second Story's pull comes from many areas. Trice was assisted by Japanese CG house Lynx, the company responsible for much of the CG rendering in Final Fantasy VII, and the CG intros in the Shining Force 3 games. Lynx's expertise and contributions are most evident in the pre-rendered backgrounds, they are simply wonderful. Though the story and translation are often criticized, and I won't mince words here, the writing flirts with 5th grade English paper territory at times while the translation does the already lackluster literature no favors. The overarching story and eventual resolution, coupled with the 86 or 87 endings, depending on how one counts them, were intriguing and were a wonderful example of grand sci-fi in the early RPG catalog. The game begins after the player selects whether they'd like to play as Claude Kinney or Randall Lanford. Uh, the actual adventure starts with Claude's first mission as an ensign with the Earth Federation under his father's supervision, who is Ronix J. Kinney from the first game. While investigating a mysterious energy field on the planet Melosenia, Claude decides to get a closer inspection of a strange device, despite being instructed to avoid it altogether, and is transported to the planet Expel which, according to the in-universe dictionary description, is approximately identical to Earth's atmosphere composition and surface gravity. Claude runs into Reyna, who inaccurately identifies him as the fabled hero of light. She escorts him back to her town for further investigation, and after that assumption is squashed, it is explained to Claude that a meteorite, called Sorcery Globe by the people on Expel, has crashed into the planet and precipitated all sorts of disturbances. Claude agrees to go investigate it, with Rinna tagging along in the hopes that she'll uncover more about her origins. What follows is a pretty epic adventure, wherein the pair encounter numerous layered and diverse side characters, a plethora of villains, and some truly fantastic locations that bounce from peaceful port cities to beautiful and bustling ornate castles. Character development and relationships, other than Rinna and Claude's main story stuff, usually unfold in sequences called private actions, which are almost like mini quests. The player can enter these while outside of any town, and what occurs is dependent on the specific characters in the party when the private action starts, and at what point in the game it takes place. Many of these moments are important as they help to determine individual motivation, background, and establish deeper character connections, be it romantic or platonic, for better or worse. Despite what I said about the stilted writing and poor translation, the writers did create some pretty meaningful scenes. Again, even though I'd argue the impact was lessened due to the odd phrasings and grammatical errors. But by the time Claude has to make some major decisions, the emotional weight is still hefty enough to be felt by the player, and the scenes were constructed in a way that it didn't feel as ham-fisted as some of the contemporary critics felt. There's no denying that it needed some more concentrated localization efforts and some fleshing out of major character developments, but the fun of simply being in this world and interacting with Expel and its inhabitants, and eventually other places as well, and its fantastically realized environments made it easy for me to overlook some frustratingly poor writing segments. Star Ocean's innovative combat system is truly a joy to play. Rather than the traditional static turn-based formula, battles take place in an arena of sorts that allows for full movement of the player-controlled character, which can be any character in your party, with others following broad predetermined orders in real time. 
Uh, this freedom allows for more engaging combat and some clutch evasions of powerful moves, uh, leaving the player with a feeling of being rewarded for skilled play. While admittedly most encounters can be overcome by merely locking onto a target, spamming the attack button, and overwhelming individual enemies, uh, though this is not at all true as late game creeps in. There are also skills called killer moves that can be assigned to the L1 and R1 buttons and become more powerful the more often they are used. These moves oscillate from devastatingly potent to hilariously ineffective. Still, they are varied enough that each character has several viable and fun options in this department. It also helps add some variance from playthrough to playthrough. What I really appreciated about Star Ocean was how the systems played off of each other. The player gets into battles to gain SP, which in turn is spent on skills that are purchased at shops, and these skills increase combat stats, unlock specialties, and others provide combat bonuses, like counterattacks for instance. There are a few skills that are hard to nail down the exact function they serve until the player experiments with them or seeks external sources. This is, unfortunately, a common occurrence, or it happens enough to be noticeable. Specialties are abilities that allow a character to craft items in accordance with an area of expertise, such as cooking or writing. Every item created in this way has some sort of substantial, tangible gain for the player, be it cooking to make food for recovery or publishing a book for monetary gain. I thoroughly enjoyed how seamless the crafting was, once the player has figured out the somewhat clunky menu system that is, and how most of the items were easily acquired. Crafting is made significantly easier with certain talents, which represent an eight skills in some area. There's a bit of frustration among a small segment of fans over how certain talents disproportionately raise the success rate of particular tasks versus the usefulness of others, and that endlessly restarting the game to make sure a character starts with those traits is too tedious. For instance, getting dexterity is very important for early pickpocketing and some cheesy early game strategies. I have to counter that by saying that with a normal playthrough, not starting with a specific talent isn't a death now or as large of a detriment because most of the traits can be learned and when learned grant a large pool of SP. What did irk me was the conspicuous absence of some baseline explanations on how these systems and their various components functioned and how interrelated they were. Yes, there is a slow start that allows the player to fool around, but the game doesn't include enough information. Not that I'd want some ridiculously long-winded explanation bogging down important parts of the game, though. I can already hear those defending the games and its contemporaries and visionaries of the time by stating that they valued exploration and experimentation and creating systems that actively encouraged this rather than babying or insulting the player's ability to work through a game's complexities. In fact, I've even made this argument myself. But it does strike me as odd and lamentable that they'd create such specific and fun interactions with skills and super skills and passives and do such a substandard job of explicating the individual skills or even attempting to lay a more accessible groundwork for the player. Nevertheless, once these interactions are understood, be it through rote or external sources, it greatly enhances and diversifies how each playthrough is approached, and you will be playing through this many times if you do fall in love with it. It just invites multiple playthroughs. While I usually have a hard time looking past clarity issues, conveyance problems, and an abysmal translation, I'll have to cling to the frustratingly vague fun factor cop-out. The combat is frenetic and instantly rewards smart investments. And that is, when you finally realize exactly what you're going to spend the SP you've gained on. There are numerous ways to break the game, if you so happen to enjoy that, but it isn't something easily stumbled upon, so I don't necessarily consider that a bad thing either. You'll have to do your research to acquire the game-breaking weapons hours in advance. Even without those weapons, good old-fashioned grinding out levels also works wonderfully and rarely felt bothersome given the quick engagements outside of a few monsters that spanned annoying spells or stunlocked a character or two. That and an artistic style that gushes out era-defining pre-rendered backgrounds that are busy and intricate while not being too loud or worse yet too bland. The soundtrack is also superb and with drastically better synth quality than its competitors. And while other JRPGs of the time have more clearly defined systems and polished presentations, many of these games lack what Star Ocean 2 has in spades. And that's just fun. 
It's just a blast to play and experiment with things in this game's world. From private actions and towns to further develop character connections to skill usages to different recruitable characters and endings. It's a blast of a game that warmly welcomes you back every time. If you enjoyed the review, don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment. My Twitter is also located right below the video. This has been Andrew with High Level Reviews, and I appreciate you guys stopping by.